When Germany conquered the Netherlands in May 1940, they installed their own regime. They were assisted by the Dutch Nazi Party, the NSB, the National Socialist Movement, National Socialistische Beweging. But this party already existed before the war. It was actually founded in 1931 by Anton Mussert. How successful was this party and how did the Dutch perceive its ideology? What about Dutch fascism? More about that in this video. Stay tuned. Hey, good to have you back on the channel. If you happen to be new, my name is Stefan. I'm a history teacher from the Netherlands and I'm hustling history for you. And if you liked it, then well, consider subscribing and do hit that notification bell. As in other European nations, there was dissatisfaction about parliamentary democracy in the years after the First World War. Yet, in the Netherlands, there was a difference since the Netherlands had not participated in the First World War. Therefore, there was no socio-economic disruption and widespread upheaval, as well as uprooted soldiers that basically stood at the base of fascism and national socialism in respectively Italy and Germany. That was in the Netherlands, not the case. And there was anti-Semitism in the Netherlands, but it was only in a mild form. Therefore, the Dutch fascist parties that would emerge in the 1920s were not anti-Semitic. According to the NSB itself, the founding father of Dutch fascism was a Dutch philosopher called Gerard Bolland. Since we're discussing a lot of theories here, much of it is contested. And Bolland himself was not an outspoken fascist, but he was very anti-democratic. He also was very anti-Semitic and he received a severe backlash from that by the Dutch press. Now, he was inspired by Hegel. There was a revival of Hegel philosophy due to this Dutch philosopher. Professor Valkenier Kips, yes, he would later be an outspoken fascist. And interesting enough is that one of his students was Anton Mussert, the future leader of the NSB. Now, at the time Mussert was a student, Kips was not a um, self-proclaimed fascist but he later would be and of course his anti-democratic and elite views resonated with the young Mussert as a student. The first Dutch fascist party was a union of actualists Verbond van Actualisten founded in 1923. Strongly inspired by the Italian fascist movement they called themselves actualists. Over the course of the 1920s fragmentation led to the decline of Dutch fascism. It was only with Hitler's rise in Germany that National Socialism became more of an example. So was the NSB a fascist or a National Socialist party? Well, you assume the latter, hence the name. And I think what is more interesting is how the NSB perceived itself. Did they see themselves as fascists or national socialists? Here's an example of a publication of 1923. Whether our movement is national socialist or fascist is essentially indifferent. It's not about the flag, but about the charge. Not about the name, but about the principles. We do not imitate German national socialism. We are not anti-Semitic, for example. And we do not import straightforward Italian fascism. Over the years, the NSB ideology would evolve. So let's take a look at the development. The NSB was founded near the end of 1931 by Anton Mussert and Cornelis van Geelkerke. This happened in the Dutch city of Utrecht. It's actually where I live. Soon after, another Dutch Nazi party saw the light of day, the NSNAP, the National Socialist Dutch Workers' Party. This party would fragment. The NSB would stay together. The NSB was nationalistic and wanted a corporate state. For entrepreneurs, the party program offered a recognition of private property, a ban on strikes for workers, and an obligation to work for all citizens in the future National Socialist state. For workers, there was a profit sharing in some companies, a favorable pension plan, and health insurance. The workers were to be inspired by community spirit, the skill of sacrifice, and the idea of solidarity the party program taught. Not the interests of their own class, but of the entire people was paramount. The NSB presented itself as the third way. Not socialist, not liberal, but national socialist. Contrary to German national socialism, the NSB did not advocate living space or Lebensraum as Hitler did it, but they did advocate for the maintenance of the Dutch 
colonies. And despite not having an aggressive expansionist ideology, they did want the army to be reinforced. And where the Germans, when bringing the Hitler salute, shouted Sieg Heil, the NSB members shouted Hause! Yeah, Hause. What does this mean? Well, it can be seen as a variant of like hurrah. If you would translate it literally, it would mean like hold sea, like stay on course or something like that. Referring to the Dutch maritime tradition. If you have other ideas on that, leave your comment down below. Initially, the party was not anti-Semitic, but it would later develop as such. This wasn't decided by the leader Mustard himself, it came from below. Although to the outside world, Mustard did not claim to be anti-Semitic, he eventually decided near the end of 1934 that Jews within the party were not allowed to have leading positions. From 1935, when the Nuremberg race laws were adopted in Germany, the party would focus itself on German National Socialism. Now, the party soon got caught in its own web of ideology. See, the party claimed to be ultra-nationalist, but why would they then follow Germany as an example if the party was so pure Dutch? Because it wasn't. Already in 1933, the NSB was charged with treason. Its members were scolded for Hitler servants. The NSB claimed to be typically Dutch, but marches, uniforms, drills, well, these were not things that were associated with being typically Dutch. And by affiliating itself with Nazi Germany, Mussert had to defend all Hitler's political decisions. And within the party there were differences too. This would later play a part during the Second World War when the Germans had occupied the Netherlands. See, Mussert, he advocated for a Germanic confederation of states where the Netherlands would maintain its autonomy. However, other members like Feldmeier and Rost van Tonningen, they foresaw a German empire in which the Netherlands would be merged in. Yet, the party did see some success. Now, its first years were a struggle. But... In 1933, when Hitler had gained power in Germany and the results of the economic depression became more and more visible in the Netherlands, its membership started to grow. In 1935, during the provincial state's election, the NSB gained 7.9% of the votes, which was a huge amount for a newcomer. An impressive result also looking at how compartmentalized, or verzeld, I'll get to that later, Dutch society was. By the end of the year, the NSB had around 50,000 members. They also established a military arm, the Weerbaarheidsafdeling, Resilience Department, and a youth movement called the Jeugdstorm. The youth storm. Another reason for its success was the leadership of Anton Mussert. He was a knowledgeable organizer and not an extremist adventurer. According to historians, he was associated with decency, moderation, and ideological vagueness. See, many of his members came from different fascist factions, and Mussert was able to unite them by not being outspoken on topics that divided the fascists. Mussert was pragmatic and managed to keep a party that consisted of clashing egos together. Another reason for the NSB's success was the uses of modern methods of organization and propaganda. Ideologically vague, but very strict when it came down to organizational structures. Therefore, it didn't fall victim to fragmentation what many other Dutch fascist parties had. Symbols, rituals, flags, uniforms, marches and many other fascist aspects kept everyone in line. Mass meetings also attributed to this. Yet, however, many people were drawn to the party, even more people were repelled by it. And because of its ideological vagueness, the party lacked clear political point of views. Often, NSB propaganda was too ambiguous and too academic for the ordinary Dutch person to understand. It failed to attract the large labor class. Dutch society proved to be too compartmentalized for Zelt. Catholics, for example, remained loyal to the Catholic party, even more when their bishops called upon them. Protestants were afraid of their own sovereignty, liberals were appalled by the NSB anti-democratic viewpoints, and so the NSB never achieved a big role in pre-war politics. And as membership dwindled, the party became more and more of a cult. It was only after the German invasion of the Netherlands it would play a leading role in Dutch politics. Well, leading role, really? 
What was the role of the NSB during the Second World War? Well, that is something I'd like to cover in the future. Do not forget to subscribe. Now, this was just a general overview of the pre-war years of the NSB. Um, if you'd like to see more in-depth videos about this topic, let me know in the comments down below. Thanks to my patrons you see on screen. And a special thanks to Joan, Peter King, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, RL, and Colin Castleman. If you want to know more about the NSB's role in the recruitment of Dutch Waffen SS volunteers, you click right here. Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now.